Millions of years ago, almost the entire territory of Poland was flooded by the waters of the prehistoric sea. Protruding above the water level, creating an island, was a fragment of what we now call the Sudetes Mountains. Rivers flowed down from the island, carrying sand, silt and bits of rock as they went. This was deposited at the bottom of a shallow bay, forming layers of sediment. Under the forces of pressure and temperature, the loose sediment transformed over time into massive rocks. Finally, the water level dropped and the floor of the bay was exposed to the tropical heat, erosion and the destructive energy of tectonic activity. Powerful rock movements shifted, squeezed and slowly lifted the cracked floor until it formed a plateau crossed by fault lines. The climate and erosion of the glacial period led to the acceleration of its decomposition. The relics of this plateau, which still exist today, form the characteristic landscape of Poland's so-called Table Mountains. The mountains are located in the central part of the Sudetes range in the vicinity of Kwotsko, near the border with the Czech Republic. The forces of erosion have never stopped affecting our planet. Slowly and patiently, they carve into the Earth's surface. The same forces act on the Table Mountains. With gentle persistence, they gradually crush sandstone blocks, tear at fault and carve valleys into the sedimentary rock. The sandstone remains, lying abandoned in the valleys, are evidence of the power of this force. The plateaus and individual rock formations were, as we know, a part of the floor of the bay, later to become part of a large sandstone plate. At the top of Skalniak mountain is a sandstone labyrinth created by the forces of nature. This shows the rock in an intermediate stage of disintegration. Erosion widened the narrow cracks in the sandstone to the size of corridors. They cut the Skalniak plate, dividing it into smaller blocks. Sculpted rocks and a tangle of corridors of different widths form a bolder city. The errant rocks, as they are known, are still subjected to this process to this day and are slowly disintegrating into smaller rock formations. The roots of the plants also help to separate the sandstone by penetrating gaps in the rock. Sandstone is susceptible to water, which dissolves the binding material and rinses out the clay. This accumulates at the point of the water outflow and is deposited on the slope. 
fluctuations in temperature and the act of water turning into ice destroy the sandstone. Some of its layers are less compact and they are the first to decompose. They are often the bottommost layers. The wind lifts and blows the crushed particles, which then hit the rocks and continue to destroy the surface. The stone mushrooms are being created. Here, sandstone plateaus are set on a less hardy substrate, which is destroyed even faster than the sandstone. The erosion of the substrate layer undercuts the top layer. Stone blocks standing on the edge slowly settle down and break off from the stone massif under the pull of gravity. This destructive process has been going on continuously for millions of years. The Table Mountains look like a birthday cake because they are layered with different types of sedimentary rock. At the base of the sandstone is fine-grained rock, so-called marlstone, which is made up mainly of mudstone and claystone. Water appears in the mountains from rainfall and melting snow. It penetrates cracks in the sandstone with ease but the marlstone provides an impermeable barrier. At the intersection of the sandstone and the plenary marlstone, water rises to the surface, creating springs, which become streams which scalp the canyons and valleys. The water drains towards the lowlands, carrying loose rock material with it. The longest stream in the mountains is the red water, which flows from a spring on Skalniak mountain. The water accumulates at the bottom of the highlands. It creates small bodies of water with no outflow from which it can only evaporate. In larger quantities, water also gathers in big impermeable areas. Over the course of time, the vegetation that grows there turns these places into vast wetlands and peatlands. Together with the vertical sandstone walls, they form the natural landscape which is characteristic of the Table Mountains. At the border of the mountains, the streams descend, as we can see here, through the steep walls of the Ratkov threshold. 
Slowly, imperceptibly to human eyes, the threshold of the mountains is being systematically destroyed. From the very moment of their creation, the mountains begin the process of gradually retreating and disappearing. Millions of years ago, the threshold of the mountains was a few kilometers further away. Its remnants are now individual peaks, so-called witnesses. Majestic amphitheatrical craters and the furthest forward spurs mark the northern border of the Table Mountains. The flora and fauna of the Table Mountains was formed after the last period of climate warming. It created the unique ecosystem we know today with sedimentary rock and mountain reservoirs. The intermediary between the animate and the inanimate world is the soil. The Table Mountains are dominated by acidic soil containing sand. Mountain meadows grow here which are valuable due to the sheer variety of grasses and herbaceous plants that grow here. The meadows provide food and survival for the very rare and endangered butterflies. On the peat soil can be found numerous living things that favor a humid environment. It is home to endangered plants that simply cannot be found in other types of habitat. The meadows and slopes of the Rogova Kopa mountain are particularly valuable sites. Brown soils of neutral pH have developed here, and it's a place where many rare species of moss grow. It is also the site, for instance, of a plant which, within Poland, can only be found in the Table Mountains. Rogova Kopa is overgrown with the original forest of beeches, firs and spruces, which once covered most of the area of the Table Mountains. Today the forest covers only a small area. Pines growing on the sandstone bastions of Szczeliniec and Skalniak have also survived. Despite the difficult conditions for development, high among the rocks, there's vibrant life up there too. Bare, well-lit and humid sandstone rocks in particular are occupied by many species of lichen. The rock's network of shelves, holes and niches is inhabited by insects and arachnids. They in turn are food for the living nearby bats and birds.
Many species of bird eagerly build their nests on the rocks, out of the reach of terrestrial predators. Foxes and badgers live in the ground level rock chambers and labyrinths, so the high rock cliffs provide a natural protective barrier. Sandstone's ability to heat up and stay warm means it is also gladly used by reptiles. Large mammals, meanwhile, take shelter between the rocks where they feel safer. There they can hide from the only predator that has always been a persistent threat to them, man. Man had little or no interest in the mountains for a long time. The terrain and climate made for difficult living conditions. Since the Middle Ages, the fear of the mountains has been gradually wearing off. Curiosity and the desire to conquer and harvest the mountains' treasures slowly prevailed. The sandstone here became desirable and valued. It was used throughout Europe as a building material. Sad fate was wrought by man upon the original beech and fir forests, which had been growing peacefully for hundreds of thousands of years. Economic plundering caused their almost complete disappearance. Deforestation was accompanied by the growth of the meadows for grazing animals and fields for crops, and the forest became merely a place for wood production. This is why the monoculture of the Norway spruce dominates in the Table Mountains today. Finally, in the heart of the mountains, the settlement of Karwuf was established. The inhabitants of the village cultivated rye, oats and flax, and from this base they explored even higher parts of the mountains. The mountain swamplands became crossed by field drains. This caused the outflow of water and hence the disappearance of many species of plant. Man entered the mountain environment and left his destructive mark on even its least accessible parts. Stelinitz, the highest mountain, was still unconquerable, however. Its high vertical walls elicited both fear and respect. 
people considered it to be dangerous for a very long time. The power of human tools alone could not suffice in conquering such a peak if man was not additionally armed with the power of his imagination and beliefs. At the highest point of Stelinitz, you can still see a trace of a Christogram. This was carved by the first conqueror of the mountain, a monk whose identity remains unknown. Was he also the first for whom the mountain looked like a flat table? A great sandstone altar dedicated to God? Despite this monk and his bold act, Stelinitz remained dangerous and inaccessible. Then one day, the king of Prussia came up with the idea of making the Table Mountains into a fortress. The first fort was built on the Bird Mountain. Then, with the help of Franz Pabel, a 17-year-old inhabitant of Karwuf, the royal sappers began to mark out the entrance to Stelinitz. Finally, a man with tools officially and confidently placed his foot on the highest peak of the Table Mountains. The king, amazed by the beauty of the place and fascinated by its geology, abandoned his fortification plans. In the rocks of Stelinitz, man saw a labyrinth of corridors, deep cracks and caves, looking like the monumental ruins of a stone city. a relic of ancient history transferred directly to the industrial era of mankind. Low temperature and high humidity remain in the cracks for a long time. As a result, snow often remains here right up until summer. Within the rocks are numerous caverns containing the gases released during tectonic movements. Large sandstone rocks are under constant pressure, movement and deposition. The forces of erosion have created some truly vivid forms here. They were named by Franz Pabel, the first royal guide in Stelinitz. The poet Johann Wolfgang Goethe and President of the United States John Quincy Adams were among the first to state their admiration for the natural wonders of the Table Mountains. Franz Pabel devoted 71 years of his life to making Stelinitz accessible in safety. Thanks to his efforts, many conveniences were created for those wishing to reach the summit. Wooden stairs, later replaced by ones of stone, footbridges, paths, viewing terraces, handrails and finally a tavern. A new branch of the economy, tourism, was just evolving. For the locals, it became a seasonal source of income. 
a new road was created, connecting Karwuf with the rest of the world. Today, this road is used by hundreds of vehicles, carrying thousands of tourists and, in turn, causing losses among the animal population and creating air pollution in terms of exhaust fumes. The beauty of the mountains continues to attract new crowds. This results in further transformation, devastation even, of the natural environment. It was, of course, the mountain's own resources that lured people in the first place. At the southern borders are healing springs. They are saturated with carbon dioxide as well as the minerals from dissolved mountain rocks. The first medieval settlements were established near the springs. People came here to improve their health and then went walking through mountain trails. They visited the wild and dangerous errant rocks on Skalniak mountain and maybe even Szczelinets. Some of them, sensitive to the natural beauty of the sites, made them famous all over the world. They were described, for example, in letters by Frédéric Chopin, who treated himself with sorrel in a famous spa resort in Dusznikisdruj. This appreciation for nature impelled man to take care of the mountains in a systematic manner. In the central part of the Sudetes, the Table Mountains National Park was created. In such a closed natural sanctuary, plants and animals can now develop safely. Protective activities focus on sedimentary rocks and the ecosystems related to them. Employees of the park carry out inventories of the numbers of particular species of plants and animals and their habitats. The condition of the mountain's natural environment is constantly monitored and researched, and the park is also engaged in the gradual process of repairing that which has been broken over the centuries. Activities carried out by scientists are gradually restoring the mountain's original forest stand. One day, even the Norway spruce, which now accounts for as much as 83% of the species composition of the park stand, will be replaced. This monoculture is easy pickings for the European spruce bark beetle. Wild bees will probably return to the new forests when the environment allows. There are attempts to reintroduce them into the mountain ecosystem even now. There are also plans to better manage car traffic on the picturesque road known as the 100 Curves. But despite the restrictions introduced by the park, the Table Mountains are still open to those that want to discover their beauty. There comes a time in the year when the tourist traffic on the mountain trails begins to die out. The days become shorter, the light levels and air temperature both drop.
The living organisms of the Table Mountains sense the upcoming changes. They're in a rush to bear their last fruits and extend their own species with new generations. They are fighting for their lives. In this difficult environment, and in their search for water, the root systems of trees penetrate deep into the rocks, and as the trees grow, they overgrow the mountains. In the autumn, beech, ash and sycamore trees limit their life functions due to the shortage of water and light. This is what causes their leaves to change colour. The Table Mountains also experience periodic droughts, which weaken trees, destroy meadows, and threaten the extinction of many rare species of plants. In the autumn, the drop in temperature causes an increase in air humidity, but the amount of rainfall decreases significantly. In addition, the stream troughs and drainage system quickly drain the water out of the mountains. Observing the water lying in impermeable marble basins, filling the corridors of the errant rocks, it's easy to get the impression that there's too much water. However, this is not the case. A lower air temperature only slows down evaporation. Organisms like lichens, liverworts and ferns cope best in this kind of environment as they don't need much light or water. As we go higher in altitude, the air temperature drops and living conditions become more difficult. At night, cold air from the massives of Szczeliniec, Skalniak and Narożnik travels down towards the valleys. When the sun shines in the higher parts of the mountains, cooler and heavier air fills the valleys with a sea of fog. When the long-awaited rain finally arrives, nature can breathe for a moment. But while water sustains life, it also accelerates the erosion of sedimentary rock. It delineates new beds and gorges in the slopes. It tears away rocky material and carries it down the mountainside. Every year it dissolves dozens of cubic meters of the binding material that keeps the sedimentary rock intact. And as autumn turns to winter, the water turns into ice, blasting out sandstone and rendering the environment inhospitable to much of the flora and fauna of the mountains. In the Table Mountains National Park, man is reshaping his relationship with nature, seeking a balance that works for both sides. Erosion, however, cannot be stopped. Over the next few million years, Europe's highest table mountains will crumble and turn back to sand once more. The history of the relationship between people and the table mountains is but a short moment in the history of the planet as a whole. A special time when mountains exist in human consciousness. After all, without a human, there would be no one to admire the region's beauty. And there would also be no one who knew and understood that mountains could be born from the sea.